fundamentally, Eurozone banks can call on the taxpayers of the whole of the Eurozone, whereas British-based banks can only call on the taxpayers of the UK when things get rough. And it's it's that imbalance, trying to run an international financial services center on a national tax base is basically an unsound strategy. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. And today I'm going to be discussing the implications, both political and financial, uh, of the collapse of Credit Suisse, uh, which over the past weekend um, saw the value of its um, shareholdings and its bonds um, wiped out, essentially, to great cost for the um, Swiss taxpayer. I'll be discussing this issue with John Stevens, our chair, who obviously has many decades of experience in the banking world um, and will be commenting also on the political implications of this um, disaster um, for uh, the financial sector of the whole of the Eurozone and for the City of London as well. John, did this uh, collapse come as a surprise to you? Um, what do you um, trace it back to in the immediate or, or medium term past? Well, there have been um, problems hanging over Credit Suisse for a very long time and all sorts of errors of management and scandals and things that have um, led to a, a steady decline in its um, valuation and uh, speculation about its future. But what tipped um, them over the edge was the crisis in America stemming from uh, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and the uh, knock-on effect that that has had Um across the banking sector in the US and the Fed um, stepping in to guarantee deposits. And behind this, of course, lies the impact of the very sharp rise in interest rates, which we've seen over the last um, year, uh, after a period of very low interest rates, really since the 2008-9 financial, uh, global financial crisis. And this sharp change in interest rate environment um, has obviously left a lot of people badly positioned. That seems to have been the reason um, that triggered the problems at uh, Silicon Valley Bank. But I think behind that are also questions about the uh, financial status of the of some of the hitherto very um, uh, high growth stocks in the in the U.S. tech sector, and that some of the collateral that the bank had for its loans. Um, may not have um, been worth uh, quite what they thought they were. So I mean, there, there are multiple problems here, but it was the the, the uh, uncertainty about the US banking sector triggered by that feeding into um, concerns over Credit Suisse and people withdrawing deposits, basically. It was a classic bank run, in essence. You mentioned SVB and the American government's reaction to it. Uh, there was a British aspect to this and the British government working with HSBC. Um, what comments have you got on that? Well, yes, yeah, so the, over the weekend, um, they uh, arranged for HSBC to buy out the, the UK end of uh, Silicon Valley Bank um, because of the number of British high-tech companies that were banking with Silicon Valley Bank and the fear that their deposits would be wiped out. Um, by a failure of the bank. And this has raised some eyebrows, I think, that uh, HSBC undertook this operation and that it wasn't uh, done um, somewhat differently by um, the government first taking it onto its own books in some form or um, trying to seek other partners. Um, largely because the government has made such a concern over the Chinese threat to British high tech. Uh, and it does seem that now HSBC is going to be um, responsible for the bank accounts of many very strategic, potentially strategically important businesses um, in high tech in the UK. And HSBC, of course, has a, a somewhat um, controversial relationship with the Chinese government. It's but supported the Chinese government's position over Hong Kong. And so it, it does seem a further example of profound incoherence in this government's approach. On the one hand, it is um, going along with a, with seeing China as a tremendous threat. On the other hand, it, it wants to have some form of economic partnership with it. The confusion in the strategic uh, 
review over whether China was a threat or not seemed to be quite revealing. And now we have this in in the, the real world of, of finance, in the, the financing of some very key industries uh, from the point of view of the future of the UK economy. Um, so once again, one's rather baffled by a lack of strategy, really, from this government over what it's doing in this sector and indeed in others. Will it affect the stability of the Eurozone? Dominic Cummings uh, had a tweet um, gloating at the problems of the uh, Credit Suisse, which he seemed to think would impinge largely on on the Eurozone. Is that right or is that wishful thinking? I I don't think I don't think that is right at all. I mean, it is true, of course, that this problem of uh, a very long period of low interest rates and then a sharp shift upwards um, has meant that a lot of uh, bond holdings both government bonds and private sector bonds, um, are now yielding less than current interest rates and therefore are in terms of valuation underwater. Um, And that could affect the holdings of uh, European banks of European government debt. Uh, On the other hand, there is what this has revealed is the very significant difference between government debt and private sector debt. Um, Because what has happened to the bondholders of uh, Credit Suisse is that they've been effectively wiped out. Whereas that doesn't uh, that that's not a, a realistic option for the holders of of, of government debt uh, in the eurozone or, or indeed elsewhere. I think there is a, a larger question here, also that um, the difference in regulation um, between the eurozone post the crisis of um, well 2010, 11, 12 in in the case of the eurozone earlier, obviously in the, in the US. Um, has been that the European banking sector is now much more regulated, in fact, than the US one, and more and more um, and and more capitalized. Um, I mean, it remains to be seen how the Fed deals with the concerns in in America, and clearly there there is a knock on effect in terms of of uh, uh, optimism and um, market stability uh, caused by problems in the U S but, uh, this is very much, uh, an American problem that has had a specific, uh, Swiss end to it, uh, rather than one that has really any immediate relevance for the Eurozone. Sometimes people draw comparisons between Switzerland and the United Kingdom, um, small, a small country in the case of Switzerland, a medium sized country in the case of the United Kingdom, uh, with an enormous uh, financial sector, which um, might um, make it make both those countries more vulnerable to external negative financial developments. Did do you see that comparison? Are, are there any comparisons or, or lessons to be drawn from Credit Suisse um, for the City of London and, and the regulation of it? Well, I think this is a reminder um, of how difficult it is to run an international financial centre on ultimately a national tax base. I mean, that's the problem of the UK. And that was the the problem in 2008, that we had to, in very short order, effectively double our national borrowing in order to save the the banking system in the the city of London, on which we had concentrated uh, over the previous three decades, um, our economic efforts increasingly. And an overweight financial um, sector um, can, ultimately only as good as the tax base behind it. And of course, Switzerland is in exactly the same position. And I mean, depending on how this whole thing um, pans out, potentially the Swiss have got a a significant problem. They're on the taxpayers are on the hook for significant amounts of money, potentially. And they also have now one bank, which is very large systemically. Um, for which they are responsible. And um, I think it's going to be quite a difficult uh, set of arrangements with international regulators of how the merger between UBS and and, and Credit Suisse can actually be managed and uh, maybe some some parts of it sold off and and, and, um, uh, its size rendered more acceptable uh, from the point of view of the risk profile that has now been set up for the Swiss National Bank and for the for the Swiss taxpayer. And I think beyond that, there, there's a further point, which is that one very big problem in 2008 for the UK was that 
we had a, a whole lot of banks that were required bailing out, and they had to be bailed out in dollars. And of course, the Bank of England can't print dollars, and the Swiss National Bank, in many respects, uh, an extremely um, uh, uh, cash-rich operation, um, has also got the same problem, that he can't print dollars, ultimately. And so this has underlined the vulnerability of the financial system and the difficulty that medium size or smaller players that have a, a very large financial sector, international financial sector, uh, outside their own currency, uh, that is a high risk thing to do from the point of view of taxpayers, which is why one has to regulate the banks very heavily to ensure that they don't end up um, having to be uh, supported by by the taxpayer. In the negotiations um, leading to the trade and cooperation agreement, the post-Brexit negotiations, um, there was a, a lot of muttering of uh, about the unease that many in continental Europe felt uh, about the position of the city. It was one of the reasons why so little could be agreed in the financial services sector, because there was a fear that a, a, a less regulated city might be a, as a, an important neighbour to the Eurozone, an important source of, uh, of instability within the Eurozone. Um, do you think that fear will have been reinforced by the events uh, surrounding Credit Suisse? Well, it will have been, but I'm not sure that fear was really the most decisive element in in the, the complete failure of, of any deal on financial services. I mean, the, the fact is that the, the situation in which London was in while we were in the in the in the EU was completely anomalous. We were the the financial center for the Eurozone and we weren't in the Eurozone. And therefore we had a, a, a actually astonishingly privileged position in some respects. Um, but we were not subject to the uh, same degree of regulatory oversight that the um, European Central Bank wished to have over its um, the operations in its own currency, the euro, because those were um, because in as much as those wholesale operations were overwhelmingly conducted in London and, and still are to a degree, um, those would be um, under the regulatory control of the Bank of England. And that situation was completely unsustainable, um, which is why, really, as once we decided not to join the euro, we were actually, in some respects, on a divergence path from the the, the eurozone, the core of the EU. Uh, and it was a position that would have to be resolved at some point. And it was resolved by Brexit. I mean, the alternative would have been that we would join the euro. It, it's been the aspiration of this government. Uh to elevate the financial sector, financial services sector, um, to one of the, uh, the poster boys of Brexit, that it would be possible to have a, a much more deregulated, a lighter touch regulated um, uh, financial sector. Um, and the Edinburgh programme was something that people talked about. Um, where are we on that? And has Credit Suisse um, uh, affected the viability of that programme? Well, I think it's, it's really um, knocked it out of court. Uh, I mean, the it's quite clear from what's happening in the US that the, the, the regulatory regime that was put in place uh, following the, the, the global financial crisis has not been adequate. I mean, it is a surprise that we are having these problems in medium-sized banks across the US, um, which have required the Fed to step in and, and potentially guarantee uh, deposits on a very ample scale. Um, and the, the idea that um, any form of deregulation now is going to be uh, attractive for the Bank of England, um, I think is complete fantasy. I think that the, the Edinburgh um, proposals are essentially dead in the water because of this crisis. Uh, and it remains to be seen how what further regulatory arrangements uh, emerge from it, because I'm sure they will. But I, I'm sure there'll be a political incentive for this government. Um, to try and say that it is proposing a deregulatory approach, because that was one of the, the main themes of Brexit, um, that somehow the United Kingdom was cribbed and constrained by unnecessary regulations coming from Brussels, and Brexit would allow us to turbocharge the British economy um, uh, freed from that um, 
uh, Leviathan um, uh, of the Commission. Um, is, is there anything that can be rescued politically from from this prospect? No, I think I think this um, situation has underpinned how how that was really an illusion, and we've already seen that uh, the problem, the fundamental problem thrown up um, by the rise in interest rates. Uh, has also has already been uh, a cause of crisis in the city of London. We saw this at, at the time of the um, uh, trust quarting um, budget, that um, the the impact on the gilt market and the need to to to, to bail out um, pension funds that had uh, positioned themselves wrongly um, for the rise in interest rates, which we've seen. So I think that this. The, the one thing the Bank of England will certainly want to avoid is much rhetoric from the government um, on further deregulation, because that's likely to risk stability. Um, I mean, there is a question about whether uh, UK banks might be in the frame in if this crisis continues and how they, how they would um, perform relative to or how they stand relative to to Eurozone banks. I mean, the, the really fundamental question is that if you are running... Uh, international banking operations, uh, and you are dependent on a national tax base, that is a risky thing to be. And the great strength of the Eurozone is that it, even though the degree of mutualization of debt is, is still got, uh, still in its relatively early stage, um, although there has been very significant progress in the last uh, few years for a range of reasons, um, nevertheless, fundamentally, Eurozone banks can call on the taxpayers of the whole of the Eurozone, whereas British-based banks can only call on the taxpayers of the UK when things get rough. And it's it's that imbalance, trying to run an international financial services centre on a national tax base is basically an unsound strategy. I saw a comment the other day that uh, in the general sphere of deregulation, um, even seven years after after the referendum, there was no coherent policy on deregulation adopted by the government because it rhetorically was in favour of it, but very often found that um, industry, financial operators, um, individuals, political classes um, didn't want deregulation. And it seems to me that it's a very good e example of cakeism, that uh, uh, Brexit was supposed to change everything and nothing simultaneously. And regulation or deregulation is a very good example of that. Um, everybody says deregulation is a good idea, except when you get to look at the regulations, and then it turns out that there are usually good reasons, politically acceptable and attractive reasons, why the regulation is taking place. Um, well, does that not apply particularly to the financial sector? Well, that, that's absolutely true. But I, I actually think that the this crisis will have the effect of diminishing the amount of rhetoric about further deregulation, because I think that is likely to make people nervous. Um, and the, the the government, I think, is left now with, with a, a, a real problem about coming up with a strategy for the city. I mean, there are, are further plans to have a an initiative uh, for the city uh, sometime in the autumn. Uh, from the government, but uh, at the moment that is essentially a blank piece of paper. We, we are, th there is no strategy for the future of the City of London uh, after Brexit. That is the truth of the matter. And when one considers the importance of this industry for the UK economy and for the tax base and everything else, that is an astonishing situation to be in. Uh, uh, astonishing, but perhaps inevitable. Thank you very much indeed, John. Uh, I'm sure we'll return to this issue in the coming months and um, we'll look forward to having similar conversations, which I hope our, our audience will enjoy. Thank you very much.